Hey folks, welcome to Weiss Advice powered by BeatStars.com. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how we can use compression to put our productions in bold. Before I get started, I need to give a special shout out to Tuna Beats for letting me use this record to demonstrate these ideas. You can check that out right with this link. He's a great producer. All right, let's get started. Compression can be used to dynamically shape things, and that could apply to the overall shape of something throughout words, phrases, and notes, or it could be used in a way to affect the envelope of a sound, meaning the attack, the sustain, and the release. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna play this record at the chorus with none of my compression effects on, and then I'm gonna turn my compression effects on and we're gonna compare the differences. Let's check it out. Kind of cool, right? It's like nothing really changed, but everything changed. And that's because we're reshaping our sounds to fit them in exactly the way that we want. Now, there are three main purposes that we're gonna reach for a compressor. The first one is going to be gently shaping the overall sound of something. And I'm gonna demonstrate that now using the piano. I'm gonna take the compressor off, solo the piano up, and what I want you to really listen for is the turnaround, meaning those last notes at the end of four bars where the scale moves in a downward pattern. Dun, 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 right? Each one of these notes is played in a very honest and live way. This is clearly tracked in just with the natural velocity of the player playing the keyboard. It sounds pretty good, but it would be good if maybe we evened out each note, specifically those last four notes in that scale, so that the end listener really can hear the melodic movement. That turnaround, that scale at the end, is going to be what brings the listener into the next phrase, and it's going to be what moves the production forward and makes the listener want to keep listening. So I think it's important that we even that out a bit. Now, when we're approaching this, generally our mindset should be slow, gentle compression. So right away, I'm thinking medium to slow release times, medium to slow attack times, light ratios, softer knees. Let's break down that idea. So I'm going to pull up a compressor. I'm going to do this in real time. My end results might not be exactly the same as what I got when I was doing this beforehand, but we're just going to find out. All right, here's how I like to generally set things up. I'm gonna put the ratio pretty high. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I really wanna hear the compression action, and then I can contour my attack time, my release time, and my knee specifically to make that action feel right. Once I make it feel right, then I can back off the ratio to something a lot gentler, and I'll still have the same basic compression action, but it's not going to be as pronounced. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate my settings. I think my release time at around 200 milliseconds, probably a good starting place, just because I know I'm going for that medium release. I want it to be slow enough that it's not reshaping the envelope of the sound, but I want it to be fast enough so that we can get our gain back up in time for the next note to be played. So I can't go too fast and I can't go too slow. For my attack time, I know I'm going to want to be in the medium to slower range, so I'm going to start at about 50 milliseconds. That's probably on the faster side of medium. It's going to depend on the instruments, but for transient heavy instruments, which this piano is, then we're pretty much in the medium range there. And from there, I'm going to start adjusting the threshold. And what I'm going to listen for is where the compression really starts to kick in. So I really start to hear the compression working at around maybe minus 27, minus 28. That's where our threshold is set low enough that the actual amplitude of the piano is triggering the compression to work. Now, I might wanna go a little bit lower than this just to catch a little bit more of the overall note. I feel like this is where we're just starting to touch the compressor. Probably wanna go a little bit deeper than that.
And you hear once I get down to about minus 33, we have compression over basically every note. It's pretty heavy, it's pretty marked, so I think we've gone too far at minus 33. So there's gonna be a sweet spot between minus 27, minus 33, and in that range, it's subjective. It's a matter of taste. Also remember that this heavier compression sound is gonna be a lot gentler once we start adjusting the ratio. So I have a feeling that somewhere toward the lower side is going to ultimately be better. All right, now let's listen to the way things are shaped. I definitely feel that compression tension being put on the attack of the sound. So I think that my attack time is a little bit too fast. I'm gonna slow it down to maybe 80 milliseconds and see how that feels. That feels a lot better to me. I feel like I'm hearing all of the strings of the piano, the hammer action of the piano come through the way a piano is supposed to sound. And it sounds a lot less affected. I'm gonna make it 50 milliseconds again so we can hear it. Now back up to 80. Maybe even a little slower. Yeah, now we still get that hit from the piano. Let's bypass our compressor and bring it back in. So the attack to me sounds like, although the overall signal is lower, the attack to me sounds pretty preserved at this point. It feels like it's about right. I still hear a lot of the compression action, and I think that that's because of the knee setting. Right now, there's a hard knee. And generally speaking, the harder the knee, the more aggressive the compression sound is going to be. So I think if we move to a medium knee or a soft knee, we're going to get a much more homogenous compression tone, and we're going to notice it kick in a little bit less. Let's try a soft knee. Back to a hard knee. You hear how that attack has this very edgy kind of a quality to it with the hard knee, and the overall signal feels compressed with the soft knee, but we don't have that edginess to the attack when we use the soft. Personally, I think that the soft knee is just applying this compression over the overall signal too much. We're going to lose some of the effect of what we're going for, and I kind of like a little bit of that edginess in there. I just think that it's a little too much edginess with the hard knee. So let's split the difference and go for a medium knee. That's starting to sound pretty good. The only other thing that I'm thinking is a little bit off is I feel like I'm hearing some of the reverb from the piano come up just a little bit. That's not always gonna be a bad thing. Sometimes that's exactly what we want, particularly with an acoustic sounding instrument. Uh, but I think for this, everything was really sitting in the right place. This is just gonna sink it a little bit too much into the background with the reverb coming up. So I'm gonna slow the release down ever so slightly. Uh, release time intervals tend to be more, um, tend to be less dramatic than attack time intervals. So 100 milliseconds on a release is really not the same as what 100 milliseconds does on an attack. So let's try 300 milliseconds and see how that feels. Without. With. Yeah, I think at this point, the only thing that's bothering me is that the compression effect is just too pronounced overall, and this is where we back off the ratio. I think that I'm gonna try four to one and see how that feels. Maybe even just a hair less. That feels pretty good. Now we're going to do a little bit of makeup gain just to get the signals to be even. So let's hear how it sounds beforehand. And then with.
That to me sounds like a two and a half to three dB difference. So let's try two and a half. Without the compression. With. Uh, maybe just a little bit more makeup gain. Before. After. Yeah, it was two and a half. Okay, so now let's listen to without the compression through the whole phrase and then with the compression through the whole phase. I think I just want to slow the attack down a little bit more. I'm hearing a little too much runoff. And then I think we've got it nailed. Yeah. If I quickly A-B them, you'll hear that the actual contouring of the piano, the way that it feels and the way that it hits, is almost identical. But the turnaround of the phrase, that's what becomes more clear. The evenness between the notes and especially in that downward moving scale. So one more time, before and then after, and then we'll move on. Perfect. So the recap of that is we're looking to approach things gently. I've got a pretty slow attack time here at 100 milliseconds. I've got a pretty slow attack time here at 300 milliseconds. I'm using a pretty light ratio, three to one. Uh, I'm not doing a whole lot of gain reduction total. It took only two and a half dB to kind of even things out. And I'm using a medium knee. So we're looking for subtler effect here. And this is just going to gently bring everything together. Now, for a more pronounced effect, we might want to reshape the internal envelope of a sound. So let's talk about about that. Now I'm going to demonstrate how we can use compression in a way that we can't really use volume automation, and that's to reshape the envelope of a sound. Now that sounds a little jargony, but to put in more musical terms, this is how we make our drums or our pluck synths or things that have uh, heavy transient information either fatter or punchier. And in this particular case, we're going to go for the snare and snap combination, and we're going to look to make it a little bit fuller. So let's listen to a before and after with some compression and start to really understand the difference. So here's what I want you to listen to when I A-B it one more time. Listen to the different in quality of the snare and snap combination that's hitting on the two and the four. The first version without compression is going to sound open. It's going to sound natural. And sometimes that's exactly what we want. However, with the compressed version, we're going to hear more of the texture of the snap and the snare, and we're going to hear a little bit more of the air that comes off of the back end of it, the kind of reverb -y quality that isn't quite reverb, that just lingers on in the sustain and release of the sound. All right, let's listen again. So it feels a little bit fuller, and I feel like we hear more of the character of the snap and the snare, and I like both of these things. Now, a lot of the times, we're not going to need to change our drum samples. I really want to stress this. A lot of the times, the sample sounds the way it's supposed to sound, and if we chose a sample for a certain reason, we chose it because it fits the record correctly. A lot of the times, if we are applying compression, the only reason we're doing it is to make it fit the record even just a little bit better. All right? So let's start breaking down what I'm doing here. First of all, I have my snare and my snaps grouped together. So I have my snaps, my snare, and my third uh, snap right over here, and they're all coming to one bus. So I'm affecting all of the things that hit together at the same time to help create this effect. Now, 
Now what I'm gonna do is use compression to bring that sound forward and make it a little bit more front of the stereo field. All right, let's check this out. I'm gonna pull up a compressor. And let's take a look at what we're really trying to do. We know that we're going to be affecting the envelope of a very fast moving drum. Snaps and snares are pretty quick. So we're gonna start with very fast attack times and release times. In fact, I'm gonna start them at zero milliseconds and one millisecond. That's as fast as this can possibly go. And it is going to sound terrible, but this is just a starting point so that we can start to figure out what we really need. Now I'm gonna turn the ratio up I'm gonna turn it up to 10 to one. I always like to do it in an exaggerated way. But the thing with this is because we're talking about a snap and a snare and we're looking to really just tighten up the way the body is living relative to the attack, we might actually keep the ratio pretty high. And lastly, for the knee, pretty sure we're gonna to wanna to keep a hard knee because this is supposed to be an aggressive sound. All right, so let's begin by finding that point in the threshold where we really affect the snap and the snare. So I started to hear the effect down at about minus 20, but it really becomes a little bit pronounced and like very audible at about minus 25. If I go down to minus 30, you hear that the snap gets really, really clamped on. So we're, we're doing too much here at minus 30. I think that around minus 25 is going to be where we want to do our work from. Now, we want to get the body to come up. So what we're looking for is a release time that's as fast as possible without it sounding like it's distorting in a way that we don't like. Because this is a snap and a snare together and it has a lot of frequency content, I personally find that a little bit of distortion that comes from the compression is actually a good thing. And if this were a kick, we would probably think otherwise. We would get these non-harmonic tones that would make the kick sound fuzzy and maybe not quite as clean and as crisp, but with a snap and a snare combo, a little bit of fuzzy kind of gets masked, and so it's kind of okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back off the release time and listen for a spot where it sounds aggressive, but it doesn't sound totally fuzzed out. I kind of like 10 milliseconds. I feel like I can hear that release from the compressor pretty clearly. And that's kind of what I'm looking to bring out, that air that's around the snap. If I turn this down to minus 30 on the threshold, we'll hear that the release becomes a lot more pronounced. It almost sounds like we've turned up the reverb that's on the snare, right? So I'm gonna put it back to minus 25, which I feel like was a uh, slightly better spot for this. And I'm gonna keep this pretty fast release time at 10 milliseconds. Now I'm gonna start slowing down the attack because we're clamping the attack too much. It feels like we're literally squaring it off, it's flat, and to me that takes away from some of the dynamic and some of the punch. But you'll notice I don't have to turn the attack time very, very slow at all for a lot of that attack to come right back. Listen to the difference between zero milliseconds and four milliseconds. Right, it's like one sounds like a toy drum, like something off of like a really cheap drum machine, and the other one sounds like the snap-snare combo that we had to begin with, and I've literally made a five millisecond change, and that's it. If I take this threshold down, we're gonna hear that even more so. Pretty big difference. So let's go back up here to 25. And I think I want to slow the attack down ever so slightly more. Maybe let's try seven milliseconds because I do want a good snap to come through. Nice. And just for funsies, I'm going to turn the ratio up and see what happens if we get even a little bit more aggressive with our compression. Okay, I feel like the snap starts to dull out, but somewhere between 10 and 12, I think is going to be about where we want to be. That feels pretty good. All right, let's bypass our compression and then let's level match.
they actually sound pretty close to level matched. I think there's maybe about a one dB, one and a half dB difference, something like that. And let's go a little bit lower on the threshold. There we go. Now I'm starting to really feel like I'm hearing the reverb off of the tail of the snare. And I think we need to turn it up maybe half a dB more. There we go. Yeah, those are about level matched. And now we've got a little bit more body and a lot more release. So without the compression, with. And we'll really notice that difference in the mix itself. Here's without the compression. Here's with. And just because I feel like it needs it, even though the level's about right, I feel like just letting an inch more attack through is gonna be healthy for the record. Great, so now we have more body to the snare. Now let's flip on over to the kick here. Let's do a before our compression and then an after with our compression. All right, here's before. After. You should have felt that difference right from the very first hit. Before. After. To me, that impact, even though the kick sounds about the same, it's very clear that the kick is hitting harder. So what I'm doing with the kick is kind of the opposite effect of what I just did with the snare. The kick is a very chewy, round sound. It's been pretty heavily compressed and limited, and maybe even soft clipped a little bit to have this kind of bouncy, rubbery texture and tone. And I think it's a great kick sound, actually, to be honest. But for this record, I feel like it could use a little bit more spike, a little bit more edge and aggression on the attack. And so notice that my settings here are are very, very different. I have a very slow attack and I have a very slow, relatively speaking, release. I have a much lighter ratio, thresholds in about the same place. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a slow attack time relative to the speed of a drum. And what that's doing is that while the compressor is triggering, triggering immediately when the amplitude of the kick reaches that certain point, because the attack is slow, the gain reduction is not happening fast enough to really adjust the attack. What ends up happening is that the sustain is getting turned down on the kick a little bit. The attack is being preserved, and so we end up with a punchier drum. So I'm going to recreate these settings. All right, same idea here. I'm gonna turn the ratio up so that we can really hear the compression action. And I'm gonna start from my default assumptions, which is going to be a, a slow attack, which for a drum, probably around 50 milliseconds where we start in the slow realm. I know I'm gonna be slower than that, so I'm gonna start at 75. And then for our release, we're going to want something in the realm of like a medium slow release. So I'm going to start at around 100 and we're going to go from there. I'm also going to show what happens if we start going too fast or we start going too slow. Really interesting things, actually. All right, let's start turning this down and see what happens. It's hard to hear an effect. I'm gonna speed up the attack quite a bit and speed up the release quite a bit so that we can really hear where exactly the drum is triggering the compressor. Okay, so we hear the compression start to kick in a little bit lower than minus 20 dB. We really start to hear it about minus 25 and then it gets a lot more pronounced as we go below that.
So we're going to be in this range somewhere. Now, what becomes interesting here is the way the timing controls start to interact with the drum. For example, the slower the release goes, the less sustain I'm going to have. This is because game reduction is being applied too slowly for the sustain to replenish itself. Watch what happens if I turn the release to about 400 milliseconds. versus say 40 milliseconds. You notice that that low tone, that, that sub thump is there when we have it at 40 milliseconds, but it really goes away quite a bit when we have it at 400. If I take the compression off, we have tons of that oomph, right? Once I put the compression on, it's almost all attack sound, right? So this becomes a sustain control. The faster my release goes, the more sustain we're going to have. Now, something weird starts to happen if we go too fast. We start to get this very strange tone, especially if we have a fast attack as well. It starts to sound broken up and clipped and weird. That's because we're getting intermodulation distortion. We've made the release so fast and the attack so fast that we're actually doing dynamic change within the waveform itself and creating harmonic distortion. And it sounds like crud. Or maybe it's exactly what we want because we're doing something weird and experimental. And it's all subjective, but this is not what we're going for this time. So I'm gonna slow the release time down and get rid of that crunch. There we go. So about 100 milliseconds, I feel like I can hear the kick drum breathe, but it still has a good amount of sustain. But what we really want is the attack. And this is where things are gonna get more interesting. This control here, the speed of the attack, is actually going to control the thickness of the punch. So if I have a faster attack time, the attack itself is going to be thinner. And what's going to happen is the drum is going to take on a spiky characteristic. Whereas if I have a slower attack time, then the overall attack is going to be thicker and we're going to get more of a punch. So faster is gonna be spikier, slower is going to be punchier. And I'll demonstrate that right now. Let's set it to about 15 milliseconds. It's very clicky. Now what, what happens if I set it to 75? It starts to become punchier, right? Let's compare it again. Clicky. Punchy, right? Can you hear that the, the actual duration of the attack is lasting longer as I slow the attack constant down? That's really important because when we're shaping the envelope, sometimes we're going to want a spiky clicky kick, especially if it's something that's supposed to sound a little bit more acoustic, that we tend to get, like, like for metal records and rock records, we tend to get that sort of spiky attack. But if we want something that's more like a trap-influenced pop record, we're definitely going to want that that beefy punch. So I'm actually gonna go a little slower than this. I'm gonna go down to like 100 milliseconds, maybe even slower. And I feel like we've gotten into a pretty good range here. Now I'm gonna back off the ratio. This is to me sounding a little bit too much like a rock kick. And I want it to sound still like the original kick. I just wanted to have more of that punch in it. So let's bypass the compression. Bring it back in. I think we can ease things up even a little more. I'm gonna raise the threshold a little bit. I think we're getting too much sustain drained out of it because I still want it to have that weight. So let's try about minus 27 and I'm gonna back off the ratio a little bit as well. I'm gonna go a little faster on the release and a little slower on the attack. And let's do a little makeup gain as well, just so it's about level match. Sounded like it was about two dB down. Maybe even a little more. There we go. Before. After. 
and here we hear more punch and less sustain. Now, I still feel like there's a middle ground in there. I think maybe just like a hair less on the threshold, uh, maybe ever so slightly faster on the release, and a little bit more overall makeup gain just so that we still have the same weight there. Yeah, that sounds about right. Before? After. I think the makeup gain's a little too much now. Let's turn it down a bit. But the important thing to notice here is that I haven't made the kick better or worse. This is a really, really, really important concept because one of the mistakes that people tend to make is they just compress everything without really having a distinct idea as to why they're doing it. And compression doesn't make things better. It just makes things different. So the different has to be better in the context of what we're doing. If I take this compression off, we get this really beefy round kick. It sounds fantastic. If I put the compression on, we get this punchy, tighter kick sound. They both sound good, it really just depends on what we want from the record. So we always have to go back to context. Here's the kick without the compression we just did. Here's with. Personally, I like that punchier, tighter kick for what we're doing. It leaves a little bit more openness in the record overall, and it smacks you in the face a little bit harder, which I think is what the intention of this is. The third reason we might reach for a compressor is for the character of the compressor itself. And usually when we're trying to get that out of a compressor, we're looking to push the compressor a little harder than what we normally would be doing. Kind of like how we sort of accidentally set the kick drum too hard just a moment ago and we got that breakup and that, that crunchiness. Well, sometimes we kind of want that, although maybe not to that degree although maybe sometimes to that degree, but maybe sometimes just a little bit of it to give a little bit of flavor to a sound. And so for that, I'm gonna be focusing on this main vocal chop, which is kind of the centerpiece of this chorus. It's the main element that's giving us the personality, and I wanna make sure that it just has tons of personality to it. So I'm going to play it without compression, play it with compression, and then go through the mindset and the approach I would use for this technique. Let's check it out. So you notice that when I brought the compressor in, the vocal chop seemed to almost lift a little bit in the mix. It became a little bolder, it became a little bit hairier, it sort of got a stress to it in the upper mid-tone, which moved it a little forward. It's kind of a cool effect. So here's the way that I look at it. We're looking to push the compressor. So in order to do that, I'm gonna set the ratio really high. I'm gonna go up to 20 to one, which is much higher than what I'm normally setting things. I'm gonna set the release as fast as possible. I'm gonna set the attack as fast as possible. And then I'm gonna start turning down the threshold and I'm gonna break up the sound on purpose. Doesn't that have an interesting sound, actually? It brings up the reverb in an interesting way. It fuzzes things in an interesting way. If I do a little bit of makeup gain, it'll be easier to hear the difference. Here's without. With. Right, we're hearing all sorts of gnarly things. It's almost like it's being put through a guitar amp. It's kind of weird. Uh, another thing I wanna experiment with is how these different knee settings might change the tonality. It's going to still have the same effect no matter what. We're doing so much compression that our compression is acting over the entire signal, period. But the actual tone and texture is gonna change as I change the knee. To me, that feels a little less broken up when I set it to medium. That 
did something really interesting and unique to the upper mids. It actually depleted the upper mids and kind of focused things into like that very like warm toned mid range. I, that was kind of cool. Hard knees really edgy. Soft knee is a slightly more flattering, warmer distortion that I'm getting. So it really just depends on kind of what I want. I'm sort of really interested in this vintage setting and how that sounded. It's pretty cool. Let's do a little bit more makeup gain. Uh, and now I'm gonna start slowing down these timing constants and maybe backing off the ratio. I'm gonna start with the timing constants because that's going to overall determine what the distortion signature looks like. And then the ratio is going to determine more of how much we're actually going to get. Okay, 20 milliseconds, I still feel like I hear a little bit of that distortion characteristic, but it's less obviously broken up. Let's uh, slow the attack down a little bit as well. There's also that that sort of like um, click sound that's in there that's becoming exaggerated. I'm not necessarily mad at that. That might actually sound pretty good in the mix be, by giving like a significant attack to the downbeat of this record. But I really like how we're getting like a lot of character from this. It's it's aggressive and it's interesting and it's cool. Before. Sounds really good. There's already a really cool characteristic from the distortion that's been placed on there. Here's the after. To me, that's a little more compelling. I think I'm gonna back off the ratio a little bit just to get it kind of closer to how it started, but I want I still want a good amount of that flavor in there. So I'm gonna try like eight to one. Yeah, nice. Let's hear it in context of the overall mix. Before. After. That's really cool. I feel like it's a little too transformative this way. I'm gonna make it a little subtler. I'm gonna back off the release just a bit more. I'm gonna back off the attack just a little bit more and turn the threshold up ever so slightly. Now it's just dripping with character. I think that's really cool. It's very different than the first time around when I did this. Um, I got very different settings. If I pull them up, yeah, my settings, much lighter ratio. I had the release super fast. I kept it at like one millisecond, but I'm using a much lighter ratio. So proportionately, it's more distortion. It's like, it's, it's a more aggressive distortion, but less of it. And I'm using a slightly higher threshold. So we're gonna get a pretty different character that way. Uh, if I go to that one, it sounds like this. versus what I just came up with, which is this. And they sound different, but this is more of a creative, like effect kind of use of a compressor. And so what makes something better or worse becomes way more subjective overall. Um, I probably like the first way that I did it because it's a little closer to what the producer originally intended. And I think that's an important part of mixing. But if you are the producer, which you probably are, then you decide the intention. And there's really no right or wrong. The idea is just to approach the compression aggressively, see what you get out of it when you've set things wrong, and you either like it or you don't. All right.